Museums. 
However, recent developments in Western society have raised ethical questions concerning the holding and exhibition of human remains. The general reaction of the museum sector has been to recognise the special status of human remains, prohibit further acquisition, and consider repatriation where possible. So how did the collection and display of human remains become contentious? There are a number of reasons why this treatment has become contentious in the West. The first I'm going to discuss is the challenge to the authority of the expert, both in museums and within science. The institution recognised today as the modern museum grow out of private collections and cabinets of curiosity or Wunderkammer. These private collections provided entertainment for the collector's friends and families, but they also re reflected the personal wealth and influence of the collector, as well as the importance of the empire they lived in. As the empire spread, the wealthy had more access to more and more curiosities from around the globe. Museum development is also linked to the Industrial re Revolution, as well as the imperial expansion and colonisation. During the Industrial Revolution, many people had leisure time for one of the first times in history. And the spread of the rail network gave them an unprecedented ability to move more easily between places. At a time when international travel was uncommon for most of the population, looking at collections, whether cabinets of curiosity or eventually in museums, gave people an opportunity to explore some of the wonders of the world beyond what they could actually access themselves. Collections were also thought to be good for moral and social education, as museums collected all aspects of the world, both natural and man-made, and this would teach people about the wonder of God's creation. This theological aspect of museums eventually disappeared, from, uh, eventually disappeared. but the collection desire to, sorry, and the desire to catalogue and collect the world remained. Henry Welcom, who was a wealthy pharmaceutical entrepreneur, decided that he wanted to collect and catalogue every object associated with medicine from every culture around the world, which you'd have to agree is a rather ambitious project. But this belief that the entirety of all knowledge could be collected, displayed and understood was not uncommon, and it led to widespread exponential collection growth. Human remains were collected as just another aspect of the world, and they were housed besides zoological specimens and cultural artifacts, which hopefully we can see in this image of the Hunterian Museum. This is now housed in the Royal College of Surgeons in London, although only the human remains, not the other ones. Um, these collecting practices eventually led to storage issues, and collections fragmented on developing disciplinary boundaries. Museums, rather than universities, were the primary institutions for higher learning, and the disciplinary boundaries that we're familiar with today are largely a result of the fragmentation of museum collections. Because of the status given to museums, curators were able to present information as the authoritative experts. However, in the 20th century, events in the wider community challenged this status. A shift in importance from observational to experimental science helped to move the seat of knowledge creation from museums to universities. The civil rights movement and feminism started to challenge established authorities in a number of areas, including the museum. Political action started to be taken by indigenous groups wanting the return of their cultural artifacts, as well as control over how they were portrayed in museums. While there is a significant body of literature on the challenges to the cultural authority of the museums and museums' responses to it, these challenges did not arise in isolation from challenges to other institutions within wider society. The politicisation of indigenous groups challenged empirical scientific knowledge as the only interpretation of the natural world. And this is noticeable in New Zealand with the incorporation of Masarani Māori and biculturalism in both academia and museums. But science faced other significant challenges to its authority as well. During the 20th century, Nazi scientific excesses and the development of atomic weaponry have challenged the idea that all scientific exploration and advancements 
are progress and beneficial to society. More recently, scandals in hospitals and clinics worldwide have impacted on how human remains are discussed in all contexts, including museums. The impetus for this was the discovery of organ retention without informed consent at the Royal Liverpool Children's Hospital in Bristol Royal Infirmary in the UK. This triggered international reviews of accepted practice regarding retaining body parts, including those held by museums, as well as those in bioscientific collections. As a number of writers have demonstrated, these events played a significant role in the way human remains and museums have been conceptualised and legislated for. Society's relationship with death has also changed in the 20th century, and this has affected how human remains and museums are viewed as well. Historically, life and death were intimately entwined. Death was just another accepted part of life. World Wars I and II and the Spanish influenza outbreak led to substantial loss of life in the first part of the 20th century. Prior to this, wars had largely been limited to combatants and those people unfortunate enough to live in occupied and disputed territory. Strategies in World War I moved towards total warfare, where civilian populations and supply lines were targeted. The Spanish influenza outbreak became a worldwide epidemic, and troop movements after the war contributed significantly to the international death toll. World War II led to even more loss of life. Subsequent developments in medicine and pharmacy made formerly fatal diseases treatable as well as prolonging life expectancy and quality. Increased life expectancy alongside the professionalisation of the funeral industry has led to less familiarity with death for the general population. Today, many people in the West have never seen a dead body or witnessed an actual death. As a consequence, there has been a gradual shift in the public's understandings of death. People's familiarity with death is often through fiction, whether it be medical dramas or crime novels. All real deaths are seen as a tragedy, whether they are traumatic through suicide, crime or accident, or through the perceived failings of medical staff who didn't save a patient. Death is often no longer seen as a natural part of life. This change in societal attitudes towards death affects how human remains in all contexts are considered. Dead human, sorry, dead human bodies became objects of horror and macabre rather than just what's left after somebody dies. Bodies have long been sources of veneration, but with these changing attitudes towards death, they became more sacrosanct and in some ways more objectified. Outside of accepted funeral rites, any treatment of human remains became sacrilege. How remains were treated became incredibly important, and objections to holding and using human remains in museums and in research increased. Historical collecting of human remains was intimately connected with issues of social inequality, race, and imperialism. And concerns were raised over how contemporary human remains were acquired, particularly from vulnerable groups, such as the mentally ill or children. Different concerns existed if the human material was, was collected from the living or from the dead. In New Zealand, the codes of patients' rights governs the collection of tissue from living patients, and the Human Tissue Act of 2008 governs tissue collection from cadavers. So the Human Tissue Act states that its purpose is to ensure that collection or use of human tissue occurs only with proper recognition of and respect for the public good associated with collection or use of human tissue, whether for health practitioner education, investigation of offences, research, transplantation, or other therapeutic purposes, or other lawful purposes. This clause accomplishes two things. It acknowledges that collection and use of human tissue needs to be properly explained and conducted with respect. It also takes for granted that a valid reason for collecting and using human tissue exists and that it is for the public good. The assumption that collection and use of human tissue is necessary is not questioned 
Despite their legal acknowledgement that collecting human remains in certain circumstances is for the public good, it is still contentious within the wider public and heavily regulated. Although the acquisition of human remains from museums is a contentious issue, there are some museums around the world which are still actively collecting human remains and trying to do it ethically. I'm going to look at three different cases of this now. When considering the place of human remains in museums, one of the most influential pieces of legislation in the West is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA, of 1990. Under this act, any museum in the US which receives any federal funding must undertake an inventory of human remains and associated material. And this is with the aim of transferring those remains to lineal descendants and culturally affiliated groups. This is a very expensive and time-consuming process, and a number of museums aren't in a position where they are able to undertake this easily. So this has resulted in a number of museums just applying a blanket ban that they won't accept any more human remains. The Maxwell Museum of Anthropology at the University of New Mexico has taken an alternative approach. Historically, the Maxwell Museum has always had collect, um, human remains. This was primary, primarily through field work undertaken through the university. But they have a policy of accepting all human remains that they are offered into their collections. The idea of this policy was that if they rejected the remains, they would stay in the public domain and possibly end up on the open market. This policy of accepting all remains that they are offered means that they are able to take on the legal, ethical and financial obligations associated with the care of these remains and their associated objects. The purpose of NAGPRA can be fulfilled as the Maxwell Museum has taken on the responsibility of developing relationships with local tribes so that they can appropriately care for and repatriate these remains. However, not all of the indigenous remains that they hold can be repatriated. There have been few repatriation plans from local Native American groups, and not all remains can be identified enough to be repatriated. In New Zealand, there have been significant calls for repatriation of Maori remains. But one of the issues facing international institutions when they receive repatriation plans is their ability to assess how legitimate a particular group is and how valid their claim is for repatriation. As a Crown entity, Te Papa is able to act on behalf of Iwi with the full weight and recognition of government behind them. They petitioned for the repatriation of Koiwi Tangata through the Karana Aotearoa Repatriation Programme. It is easier to transfer human remains or objects from one institution to another recognised institution than from an institution to an individual or group of individuals. Once Te Papa holds the repatriated items from overseas, it is easier to negotiate further repatriation to particular iwi, which are recognised in New Zealand law and society. Te Papa has a culturally sanctioned repository <coughs> for unprovenanced koi iwi tangata, and they act as kaitiaki until they can be repatriated. Another museum that continues to collect human remains is the Museum of London. Thousands of years of continuous habitation and urban development in the greater metropolitan area has necessitated regulation of archaeology on building sites. The Museum of London has traditionally undertaken archaeological consultation to ensure that the archaeology is, con is conducted appropriately and this includes assuming responsibility for the disturbance and excavation of burials. The majority of the bodies discovered during these archaeological dips are not generally covered by existing guidelines on the treatment of human remains, as they are usually British. Most of the guidelines are only particular pertain to particular, generally foreign, ethnic, cultural or religious groups, with only some information from historic England on how to work with local Christian burials. These guidelines do not deal with pre-Christian burials, such as Neolithic or Roman remains. 
In contemporary collections of human remains are also being developed through scientific research. One of the more famous examples of this are the so-called body farms. The original body farm is the University of Tennessee's anthropological research facility, established in 1971 to conduct research on human decomposition, utilizing unclaimed or donated bodies. Other body farms have been established in a small number of other centers to provide forensic evidence on decomposition rates in other climates. These include Australasia's only body farm at the University of Technology in Sydney. This opened in 2016 and uses donated bodies. But how you define human remains is important. The body farms use gross specimens, but a single cell can be considered human remains. Collections of scientific samples comprise another aspect of contemporary acquisition, especially with the advent of reliable freezing technology, allowing for longer-term storage of samples. Some researchers are drawing on museum theory and practice in order to, ma to manage the large amounts of collections that they, their research amasses. Informed consent and adhering to professional and institutional guidelines is important. However, informed consent on its own is not always enough. Body world's plastinates are all created from donated cadavers with informed consent. However, the educational value of the exhibitions is still being questioned, and for some people, body worlds is still contentious. The display of plastinated remains for the general public is often viewed differently than the display of plastinated remains for health science students within formal tertiary education. The place of museums in tertiary education is one that is not well explored. The value of using experiential forms of learning is well established, but this, the majority of the research on this has focused on primary and secondary education rather than tertiary. Museums have played a significant part in tertiary education in New Zealand, with major collections being associated with universities, such as the Otago Museum. Between 1876 and 1955, the museum was administered by the university, with ongoing university representation on the board after it was repurposed as a regional museum by Act of Parliament in 1955. Staff were also shared, with the Professor of Biology as the curator for the museum for approximately 60 years, and there are still strong links between the two institutions. Otago University holds a number of collections used for teaching. The Hawking Collections is the most well known, but they are also held in departments such as the Geology Museum or the Anatomy and Pathology Collections. Although there are varying dates for the establishment of the Anatomy Museum, whether it be 1874 or 1881, depending on where you look, it was established at least 36 years before the Medical Library in 1917. This demonstrates which type of resource is considered more important. The university also uses local collections. As I said, it still has strong links with the Otago Museum, and it utilizes the classical collection for teaching. The university has a memoranda of understanding with Tapapa and with the Otago Museum, and the Otago Museum offers scholarships for students undertaking research on its collections. The W.D. Trotter Anatomy Museum in the Lindo Ferguson building is open to students undertaking a number of different courses. These include anatomy, medicine, dentistry, physiotherapy, and biological anthropology. Classes are taught in the museum, and the space is open for self-directed learning outside of class time. Staff and students realize that there are limitations when working with models and textbooks, and appreciate the ability to complete a full body dissection and work with authentic human remains in the museums. All cadavers used for dissection are donated bodies, and it is only from donated bodies that new specimens can legally enter the collections. Course materials explain that working with human remains, whether it be dissection or in the museum, is a privilege. Students understand that it is a privilege, and not something that they can take for granted, as it is not universally available in other health science programs 
Students sign a code of conduct for working with human remains, and breaches of this code have significant consequences, involving weighty fines, community service, not being able to attend graduation, or even exclusion from the university. Codes of conduct, ethics, and practice have been developed and implemented by many professional and institutional bodies. The way codes address concerns surrounding human remains is dependent on the focus of the institution they were written to serve. Where two or more professional guidelines exist within the same context, the possibility exists for conflicts over which perspective is dominant, so it is important to view these guidelines in context. Tertiary Health Science Museums are an example of this type of conflicting situation, as they must adhere to the professional norms of bioscientific professions and those of the museum community. For the scientific community, the focus is mainly on advancement of knowledge and therapies through the use of existing collections of human remains and those acquired through bequest programs. Meanwhile, the museum sector focuses largely on indigenous remains and repatriation. This can cause tension with scientific advancement and museum ethical codes which may not be pertinent to the kinds of human remains within those collections. The museums that adhere a lower code of contact, code of ethics, has an appendix specifically related to the treatment of human remains. But this largely directs members to the guidelines developed by Te Papa and the Canterbury Museum. But those guidelines uh, specifically limit themselves to the treatment of indigenous remains, particularly Maori remains. Without clear guidance on how to treat donated human remains, museum ethical codes are of little relevance to health science museums. One reason why there is little guidance for the treatment of human remains in scientific collections is that there are significantly fewer of these museums now than has previously been the case and they are less visible. Large numbers of smaller medical museums have been destroyed or amalgamated into larger collections which are less accessible to the public. Within the development of modern medicine, museums were incredibly important for medical education. In the UK, which is intimately linked to New Zealand medical education, there were large numbers of private medical schools by the early 19th century, and the majority of these contained medical museums. In fact, if you didn't have a supply of bodies for dissection and a museum with real human specimens, your business was at a significant disadvantage. Legally, there were only a small number of bodies available for dissection. For the entire UK, a maximum of six convicted criminals could be sentenced to dissection a year. Obtaining, obtaining those bodies could be difficult when their families and friends interfered with the bodies being planned. The lack of available bodies gave rise to grave robbing. Initially, it was done by medical students and staff, but eventually it became a black market business in and of itself. Poor people could get money to live by promising their bodies to medical schools. And it was not uncommon to find that when they died, they had sold their bodies to a number of different medical schools, so there were a few schools. Eventually, somebody figured out that if you murdered somebody, the most famous case of this was the Birkenhead murders in Edinburgh, and this led to the passing of the Anatomy Act in 1832. The date is important when you consider the Treaty of Waitangi was signed in 1840, the University of Otago was founded in 1869, the First New Zealand Anatomy Act was passed in 1875, and that until 1883, Otago medical students needed to complete their degree overseas with the majority of them going to Edinburgh University. It was taken for granted that using human remains in medical education and in museums was necessary. As I said earlier, the current Human Tissue Act maintains the belief that using human remains in medical education is necessary, but the continued use of human remains in museums for tertiary education needs to be continuously reviewed. Whether you believe that museums can either justifiably and ethically hold human remains in their collections depends on a number of things, including your cultural upbringing, your academic training, and your personal belief system. Legislation can change, as can attitudes in society, so there are no hard and fast rules about whether or not museums
can help, what they're doing is right. All they can do is to try and behave ethically within the context they work in. And for the last part of my talk tonight, I would like to present some of the ethical issues involved in collecting and displaying human remains that health science museums have to consider. You will all have your own individual takes on these questions. So how do health science museums acquire human remains in New Zealand in 2019? The Human Tissue Act says that human remains can be acquired for anatomical examination and public display, research and storage. Informed consent must be taken, must be given in all instances by the appropriate person, taking into account the cultural and spiritual needs of the immediate family of the individual whose tissue is to be collected. The main path of tissue to the end of collection is through the dissection room of a school of anatomy. Of the four authorised schools of anatomy in New Zealand, three are attached to the University of Otago. In Dunedin since 1876, Wellington since 1969, and Christchurch since 18, 1988. The other one is Auckland since 1888. The Otago Anatomy Museum Department runs a body bequest program to acquire human remains for dissection. Donors need to register for the their desire to donate their body before their death, and registration requires joint signatures from a family member. The department is not obliged to accept the free bodies, and strict guidelines and policies exist to determine which bodies can be accepted. The department understands that not having the physical remains for a funeral can be quite difficult for some people. A Thanksgiving service is held each year for staff and students to express their gratitude and to show their respect to the individuals and their families and friends who have participated in the program. The cadavers used for a dissection in the Otago Anatomy Department are anonymised in line with the recommendations for good practice from the, for the International Federation of Association of Anatomists. As all new acquisitions for the WD Trotter Museum come via the dissecting room, this means that all new specimens are also anonymous. The training collection has information cards for its specimens, and these cards include information about the patient the specimen came from, including their World Health Organization number. Although it's not obvious to the observer, the home number does identify the individual the specimen came from. Within the IFAA guidelines, an anonymity can only be waived with prior permission of the donor. Anonymity is supposed to protect the donor's privacy as well as helping students to learn clinical anatomy, uh, sorry, clinical detachment. However, both an anonymity and the necessity of clinical detachment are being questioned. Student comments about using anonymous human remains question if there are benefits in having non-anonymous remains. The following comments are from the Otago University students after they have watched interviews with the donors of their dissection cadavers. They're taken from Donated to Science, which was filmed in 2009 at the medical school. It feels good that there is a name and there is a face. It feels like combining these two years working on the body and now I combine the human side of the person I was working on. So now I can say that I feel I truly got to know this person. Now it's so good to have a name, so that now I can remember George, this person that I had been dissecting on. I can remember him in my prayers. To what he said in the interview about what he hopes to achieve by donating his body, so that we'll benefit and learn, so that in the future when we are out there to see other patients, then we'll benefit them. I really want to tell him that this purpose what he wants to do will be achieved. I thought I was just going to be an emotional wreck, but it turned out to be completely different. He was just such a sweetheart. He was just such an honest, down-to-earth guy, and it was so far removed from the body in the dissection room that it was not, they weren't even connected. There was a surreal disconnection. It was that guy, the person, and the body and they were completely distinct. I've done the dissection, and all the way through the dissection, I felt uncomfortable, until now. 
until I've washed this man who's given his body to us. And if I'd seen it at that start, it would have been completely different. I wouldn't have been afraid. I wouldn't have felt like I was desecrating the man, because it's what the man wanted. And I heard him say that, and I heard what sort of man he was. Should all unidentified human remains be disposed of? Issues of privacy and development of clinical detachment aren't the only concern with anonymised human remains. Disposal and use are other significant issues. There are arguments that all human remains that do not have consent associated with them should be disposed of. However, where remains are anonymous and their associated confidential information is lost or deliberately separated from them, then it cannot be determined whether or not they ever gave consent. Disposal of this material could be unnecessary and will be a significant loss of resources and information. If the remains cannot be identified, who has been harmed by their continued use? And who has been harmed by their disposal? If the argument that consent must be obtained is to protect the interests of family, is it ethically responsible to dispose of remains where no harm is being done to the descendants? where there are no known descendants to, who can be harmed. And this is tied to the previous question. If research on human remains is considered a public good, and if consent is to protect family, then where no family is known, is consent still necessary to do research that is in the public good? Should identifiable humans be returned? There are arguments that all identifiable human remains should be repatriated. These arguments usually focus on indigenous remains and do not take into account donated remains which are identifiable but willingly given. Can we do whatever we like with our own bodies or our own human remains? If consent is paramount and all that is done to our own body, then are we at liberty to do whatever we like with our own bodies? Legally, the answer is no. But should it be? There is a well-established rule within English and New Zealand law that there is no property in a human body. This means that grave robbers could not be prosecuted for stealing bodies out of graves. And it means that we are not quite as at liberty to do what we can, what we want to with our own bodies. We cannot sell them. We cannot let somebody eat them. And up until fairly recently, we could not kill them. What we can and cannot do with our own bodies is culturally and legally constrained. However, culture and legislation change. What we consider ethical and right today is unlikely to be the same as what people in New Zealand society think is ethical and right in 50 to 100 years. I have limited my discussion today to Western society, specifically New Zealand society, because just as changes occur over time with what is considered ethical, there are differences between societies, which mean that some of the ethical considerations for New Zealanders may not matter at all or at night or as much in other societies even today. The most important consideration for whether or not it is possible to justify the collection and use of human remains in museums hangs on how we use them. In the Human Tissue Act, informed consent is the most important issue. In a practical sense, on a day-to-day -day basis, informed consent is respect. Is what we're doing informed by respect and demonstrates respect? Thank you. Thank you. 
objects. Um, so objects and photos are different, but you also have to be sensitive that it is a human domain, it is what it's an image of, it's real, and so that some people are very open to that. Um, it's not quite the same as dealing with an object that you can actually touch and that actually is something, but um, yeah, it is just a representation, so there are different issues. Um, so so how in our culture view images? I'm thinking of like um, skulls with mock-up and, and tattoos that you know, have ended up in British museums and so on and have been repatriated. So if the photographs were taken off them. Oh yeah, yeah, um, no, that's still going to be a problem. Um, it is a problem. It is, yes. um, it's not just to do with human remains that are the problem with photos. So photos are also um, a sensitive object for Maori. Um, my research hasn't focused on Maori remains. I've actually taken a step away from indigenous remains because that's where the majority of the research is. So I didn't feel that I could speak to that um, with my research as much as this area. But I do know that um, from previous work and previous jobs I've had that images of Maori, whether it be paintings or photographs, are sensitive. Um, and so using any images in Māori, I think in New Zealand society it's something we dance around and I think it is something that we have to be aware of is the bicultural nature of New Zealand society um, and so working with Ewe to get their approval for what you can and can't do with images and with human remains is really important. Um, I'm not Māori, I have no relatives that are Māori I don't want to talk to our culture because I don't have a place to stand to talk about it. Um, but within the New Zealand sector in New Zealand, um, awareness and sensitivity to Maori issues is a significant part of the sector. And so we would want to be culturally sensitive to that. Sorry. When the snap attached, is there a consent process for the bit that's happening? Yes. That's part of the medical process. Um, yeah, I believe there is part of that. Um, the Dream Pathology Collection stopped collecting for a very long time, and I think it's only just started collecting recently again. Um, but they have a different process because you can collect from someone who's still alive. So there's this great story um, from the US where they were actively collecting. Um, during the, the Civil War, um, and there was a, I can't remember if it was an arm or a leg, but they amputated it and they took it into a collection. And the person who it was from ended up being a tour guide or a visitor, and he would go and visit his body part. <laughs> so there are different issues, um, but that, that's in terms of collection, but in terms yeah. of disposal, so the same process around that. Um, if it's taken, if you collect it, it's one thing, but if you are just disposing of it, then um, it's part of the medical process. So it stays in the hospital. Yeah, that's what I mean. That whole process is in the um, hospital's processes rather than the museum processes. Um, the Anatomy Museum on campus, yep. um, because that some of those things may have been collected for educational purposes, is it only available to student medicine students, or is it public? Um, it's largely just open to members of the university community, particularly those people um, who are studying or researching in that area, although you can get was if you contact the curator, who's <laughs> okay. Um, but I think it's largely limited. Museums, by definition, are meant to be public, and so they are meant to be open to whoever. But um, with university museums, because we have public um, museum, uh, public university entrance, then theoretically and technically, the museum is public because anyone can. And, um, sign up for those courses and then they can get access. Um, 
but they are, it, it, there is restricted access. It's not just walking. Do you know what the dental school does with the extracted teeth? Um, not off the top of my head, but um, it's the same as disposal of any other um, objects or body parts that is taken through medical treatment. Um, that is disposed in line with the clinical um, procedures and guidelines <coughs> that they've developed. Um, that doesn't automatically go into a museum collection. That all has to be treated with informed consent. But yeah, that material is in a whole other line of um, procedures and guidelines. It ends that there's a sort of mismatch between the historic collection and the current collection, and I'm not going to say that. I'm just thinking of the uh, skeleton, which is actually in the anatomy of the Yep. And, um, um, I'm just wondering, is there a mismatch here between the historic and the current, or is it um, actually sorted? Um, Burke's skeleton, part of his sentence was to have his skeleton on display in perpetuity. So that is actually part of his punishment. Um, but yes, there is a difference between historical collecting and contemporary collecting. Our ethics are different. Um, and we have to look back at those collections that we have, which are historic. And some of those will stay and not be looked at because it just doesn't come up. And at other times it will become an issue for the museum and they will look at it and go, actually, you know, that's something we have to address. So while we can collect um, as ethically as we can now, we do have to have a self-review of what we've done in the past. And a lot of those collections, those historical collections, are associated with issues of colonisation um, and issues of you know, theories of race. And so there are very, very large questions around those historical um, collections. And so they're huge. Um, and that is something that every museum in the world that holds human remains is struggling with. Um, but how big a struggle it is depends on quite what their priorities are at the time and their cultural context. So in New Zealand, dealing with Maori remains is a big deal. Go to England, maybe not quite such a big deal, and go to France. I know there have been significant um, investigations in France and in England about what they hold, and they are working through processes on whether or not they should repatriate or whether they can repatriate. Um, I know the British Museum has issues because they think that um, their collections fall under the British Museum Act, it's called. So they think that they can't take anything out of their collections under Act of Parliament. So there's lots and lots of issues to work through with the historical collections. Just as a corollary to that, you showed earlier on a picture of the Hungarian Museum of Royal College of Surgeons, and in that there is the Irish giant, I yep. forget his name, Jack Byrne or something. Now he was alive and well and said he did not want to be on display, but he's in that photograph and he is still on display, despite what he said all these years later, he's still there in the Royal College, but like the only thing that survived the Direct hit to an incendiary bomb in 1940, whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah, and, so, and you know, those sorts of issues come up all the time. And it's not just the medical collections that have that, but um, anthropological collections have collections of human remains. Um, and there are there's lots of work being done on on race and racial inequality and racial difference that have been done based on and whether museums still hold those collections or not, or whether they're actually following the wishes of the people who are in their collections, is really, it's piecemeal as to which, what museums are doing to their actual specific museum. Mm -hmm.
Well, please join me in thanking Paul for a wonderful presentation.